Hello, everyone. Welcome to this week's bounty episode of the Day Zero Podcast. I'm Spectre, with me is Z. Today we have a PHP bug that affects Joomla and likely others, some cache deception stuff again, and a race condition in Chrome that extensions can abuse. So we'll start off with the cache deception. So, yeah, this gives a bit of background on cache deception, which we have talked about fairly recently. Back on episode 241, we talked about it in the context of ChatGPT with caching auth tokens. But as a refresher, the whole idea there is you get something cached that contains like PII or some uh, authentication information and thus shouldn't be cached. And if you can get it cached, you can abuse that on a victim to like pull the auth token or PII or whatever through the caching. Um, typically, this is done via path confusion, as was the case with ChatGPT, where the back end and the caching on the front end kind of disagree and interpret the path differently. But in this instance, on a Synac target, they were able to trigger cache deception without doing anything with the path, really. Uh, and instead focused on the request headers, kind of targeting the request type. Um, because what they noticed was that the target would serve both static and dynamic content through the GraphQL endpoint. And the static content was cached. And what's the main difference between the static and dynamic content? Well, it's that the static content is fetched with a GET request and the dynamic with a POST request. And so they thought, okay, what would happen if we took a query which has user details and send it as a GET request? And after figuring out that they needed to include the request identifier parameter for cache keying, they found that, yeah, they, they could get it cached. So just kind of a weird setup with having the GraphQL endpoint being both static and dynamic content and being able to abuse that. I'm not sure how often you would really find this in other targets. It's probably not a super common setup. It is a bit weird, but it's, it's uh, interesting to call out. And like the post is trying to convey, uh, it doesn't always have to involve doing trickery with the path in order to, to have caching issues. Yeah, I mean, it kind of just comes down to how caching set up. I mean, I guess that's always what comes down to when we're going to talk about these sorts of issues. Just, you know, how is the caching set up? Can you find something that it should be keyed on that it's not keyed on? It's just kind of like the general name of the game on that. Um, this one's a little bit interesting, I think, just because of, you know, the GraphQL being being used for serving static files. I want to say they, okay, I, for some reason in my head, I was saying they even called out images as being served, but they do just say, you know, they noticed um, that static files were served from a GraphQL API, which is an unusual thing. And, you know, I read that and I thought like that is unusual. And then I thought a little bit, you know, back in the day, I do remember seeing databases like MySQL database or something like that where, you know, a table would actually just contain binary blobs that were like profile images or, you know, other images that maybe had a bit of dynamicism to them because of, in, in a content management system where it could be uploaded, something like that. You know, they had images and they were storing them directly in the database rather than, say, storing the path or like the name of the file and then just accessing that. And so I could imagine somebody who's now going like they have this old... MySQL database. They're like, we're going to add a GraphQL API in front of it. And how are we going to serve these images? We're just going to serve them out through the GraphQL API or for other static content. That said, this might be static content in the sense of like, here's the config for production, not like uh, passwords or anything, but just like, here's like the site name, like that sort of config type deal. Like it could be information like that, that makes a bit more sense. Either way, like, it did stand out as unusual, but I could imagine cases where, you know, GraphQL gets used this way just when somebody's moving from more of a legacy setup, trying to treat GraphQL like any other. Or I guess adding GraphQL just by adding it as this layer that's automated in front of their database, not really thinking about all of that leading to this sort of setup. Definitely an interesting setup. It feels wrong to me that the primary cache key here was this request identifier, rec identifier parameter being used. Uh, just like the inclusion of that. I don't know. Feels feels to me like the actual URL sh query should be what gets cached and not like rec identifier. It just feels wrong to me to be doing that. Um, and it creates it, it the feels case like where on and a little bit too simplistic, yeah. Yeah, because it, if it were just the request, like if they just noted the query and just used that along with some other like user info, 
by user info, I just mean like user agent and stuff that they talk about in the post. If they just did that, um, then while this is, of course, damaging for whatever user gets their information cached, when they have that request ID, you can kind of have the same request being cached for multiple users. One you sent to exploit me, one you sent to exploit me two and three and four. And you can kind of repeat this against multiple users, which just kind of increases the impact of the issue. Yeah. It just, yeah, feels a little bit wrong to me to have it there, but then, like, it's caching based off the URL, so okay. Um, like, it, yeah, it just stands out to me as being a little bit, little bit wrong, but obviously, bigger issue it just comes down to how the whole caching system is set up and what it's actually looking to cache because it's not distinguishing between caching what should be static and what actually isn't like you know why would you need user details in the query if it's being cached sort of deal like there could be some simple filters there either way i thought it was interesting very simple issue to get on it, nice that it includes the background, but I feel like most people are kind of familiar with, like most bug bounty hunters are kind of familiar with the attack now because it has been rather popular for uh, several years now. Yeah, and on what you were saying earlier, it's just the setup is asking for trouble, right, the way that it's set up, so. Yeah, yeah uh, it's a bit of a weird case, but, you know, maybe, maybe it, you can run into it in other places if it is sort of what you were saying. It was just a consequence of... Yeah, and in fairness, Putting GraphQL like, in after the fact sort of deal. Yeah, in fairness, maybe this would make a lot more sense in context, like why they're doing it this way. If we actually saw the application, it's just you know seeing it like this without some of the context information, it raises questions. And the author themselves said like this was a bit weird. Yeah. All right, so uh, getting into a fairly long post we have a post by project discovery on an exploit chain that could achieve rce in apple's production server via lucy which is a like a cold fusion markup language server the blog post is a journal style talking about the things they tried and some background some of which i'll skip over and there was also some prior research they did on lucy and uh, they'd rce'd it previously and they link off to that if that's something that you want to check out as well in that previous research, they noted that Lucy's admin panel was pretty well designed in terms of reducing attack surface for unauthenticated users. They stated that only four CFM files were accessible. So they went through to see how requests were being processed by Lucy. And uh, they discovered their support for like the application Java as a request type, which can deserialize the request data. So that's, of course, a useful sync that they were looking for. That was where they initially started looking. They went which through the also, process figuring out how to reach that. Sorry, like, go ahead. Yeah, let me just say, like, a content type for, like, user send data. So this is what they're sending, not what you're getting back. Being application. It just sounds crazy to me that anything is using that and thinking, yeah, yeah this is definitely, like, there's nothing that could go wrong here. Nothing at fine. all. Like, yeah, yeah, I'm thinking of that, like, you know, how it's hurting down. This is fine. Dog <laughs> yeah. there. Like, that's what I'm thinking of with that. Like, this is not fine to see. Um, granted, there are some, like, it is mitigated here. I'll let Spectre get into that. But just seeing that, it just seems so crazy. Yeah. So they investigated it. They found that you need a REST function that takes arguments to reach it. And they did find such a vector, being uh, Lucy's critical update server, which manages update requests. So they reported this issue to Lucy, but Apple specifically didn't expose any REST mappings. So that didn't end up being useful for what they wanted to do. So their second attempt, they tried hitting the CFML uh, expression interpreter, which if this... Uh, class, the CFML Express Interpreter class, was instantiated with its argument set to false. I believe the argument is limited. Um, so if limited is set to false, the interpret method of that class could execute CFML expressions, which is you know basically code execution. So again, they had a sync. They tried to find some areas that would meet this condition, one of which was the storage scope cookie, which was accessible through session management. They weren't able to find a good vector for this in Lucy, but they expanded the searching for ways to reach it from uh, Mira or Massa CMS, which apparently Apple also uses on the Lusa, uh, Lucy server. I'm not really familiar with them, but they expanded their search there where it's in use. And they found that the logout functionality, funnily enough, um, could call the session invalidate function, which was a sync that they had for 
being able to access the expression interpreter. The problem, though, is that rotate sessions, the rotate sessions configuration option needs to be enabled in uh, Miramasa, which it isn't by default, and Apple uses the default. So um, sort of defense in depth prohibiting that attack strategy there. Also, the client management setting in Lucy would need to be enabled to use like the CF client cookies. And again, that's disabled by default. What did end up working was hitting the variable interpreter, which depending on the limited parameter, again, it would pass through to the CFML expression interpreter. So just kind of going one level up. They found a few places that would create the variable interpreter with limited being false, being struct get is defined and empty. And while struct get and empty, they couldn't really find being used, is defined was used a lot uh, by Massa Mira, and that could be reached from the feed API, which was accessible pre-auth. Um, in particular, the param struct gets processed and passed into the is defined method when processing requests on the feed endpoint. And I that could param jump struct... in. Sorry, yeah, uh, I can jump in. So yeah, is defined was used quite a bit, but most of those cases were with static strings that were not vulnerable. They did That's find a point. case yeah. that was because it had to be loading in like some sort of uh, user controllable content. And the one they found there was this param method. And you, uh, if you're watching, you could see the pound or hashtag param.method hashtag. So that's going to uh, get interpreted. User content then ends up being fed in, whereas the static strings just remain that static string the entire time and not vulnerable. Yeah, sorry, I guess I should have been more explicit there. I was kind of assuming it was implied, right? Like doing the source to sync, like you need the attacker control data going there. But yeah, that's fair. Is defined, like, because of the method that it is. Yeah, it is used on static strings a lot. But yeah, in the specific case that Z talked about, this param struct, it could contain user controlled contents from the URL get parameter and the form post parameter. So yeah, ultimately it resolves down to untrusted input, making its way into a powerful function. But there's a lot of uh, cool information on their process and things that they tried. And we always like to, you know, highlight when posts like that go out there because you don't always get that insight into the thought process and the methodology. Yeah. And importantly, this one is about code review. And, you know, a lot of people ask, you know, how do you get started with code review? I'm not necessarily the biggest fan of saying, like, always do this source to sync, but this is a viable method, is where you find like some sync or, I guess maybe not source to sync. This is more of a sync to source style, but you know, it's a viable method. And I appreciate that they did just document here's kind of how we walked through this, where because there is kind of the connection between all of these, where they do start off with like, you know, in attempt two, they do have the CFML expression interpreter, and then attempt three is just like a sync into the or a source that leads into that sync also. So it's building off of it, showing that process. I think there's some good information there. Just kind of see the process of somebody who's actually doing this. There's more to code review, but this is definitely one method that can be applied. Yeah. And one final thing I'd want to say on it is there was a bit of interesting stuff when it came to fixing the issue, because when they reported it, uh, Apple fixed it promptly. I think they said it, Apple fixed it within like 48 hours. But when this was reported to Lucy, Lucy had noted that like they noted this was already a known behavior. But in the interest of preserving backwards compatibility, they left as defined as is, like with all the behavior with it. Uh, though they did add a system property to, I'm assuming, override the limited parameter for expression evaluation. I'm not sure on that. They don't really elaborate. But yeah, this does fall into the category of one of those like won't fix kind of issues on the Lucy side. So uh, I thought that was a little bit interesting and worth calling out. Yeah, it feels like, I mean, just saying, yeah, let's not secure things because that is, you know, old behavior. Because that's the way we've always done it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that, I not really don't like that. Take, but... um, and we should also mention, uh, from Apple, they did get a, a $20,000 bounty, which is a oh, pretty good bounty. That. That's nice. Yeah, so they had a good bounty here, uh, which we should have mentioned earlier. But yeah, solid bounty on it. Not a fan of Lucy's response, but... We can't really change that anyhow. So our next blog post is a PHP bug that was detailed by Sonar and is quite an interesting bug. I'll admit, when I first saw the post and saw it was resulting in XSS, I expected it to be fairly run-of-the-mill. But there's some great technical info here and a really cool bug, so I'll let Z get into it. Yeah, and like I said, at a glance, when it first came up, I saw, oh, you know, it's get input. Like, it's Sonar Cloud, you know, 
that's what they're doing. This is Sonar Source. It's their blog. They're running Sonar Cloud on open source projects. It's like, oh, user control data gets reflected. Oh, no. Like, we've seen that a ton of times, whatever. Uh, but it turns out, so this is get function that, you know, get input, get. It calls this, or it mentions string on the end here which is just going to be the type of filter to apply to what it's getting. So they kind of enforce needing to tell it what type this should be parsed as rather than just allowing users to provide anything at all that will get echoed. Sorry, I'm not sure if we mentioned this. This is impacting Joomla ultimately. I think I said that at the start of the episode, but I think I kind of skipped over it when I was introducing the topic. So Yeah, and Joomla yeah. content management system, fairly popular. I mean, it's not WordPress, but... It's been around for a good amount of time. <laughs> anyway, so they have the function there, get input, get, and it's going to pull in whatever type you tell it. It'll do the filtering. And that's where we get into this issue. It is a filter bypass. And their filter logic, the high level idea of this, or at least a part of their filter logic, is they do have this uh, clean tags function that gets called. You'll pass in that the idea is that this should strip all of your HTML tags from whatever input was given. And the way that works is that it will, you know, scan for the start, like the uh, start angle bracket, and then it will continue reading until it finds the end angle bracket and then just remove all of that content. And then, you know, it keeps scanning the string. If it finds another one, it removes that. So it'll remove both the start and the end tags. And like any any number of tags that are in there ends up removing all of them. So fair enough. In theory, that sounds okay. And the code ends up using just like they have the string helper functions here for stir pause, str uh, position, string position, and for substring, which just wrap the multi-byte functions that are built into PHP, the MB string function. So MB underscore str pause and MB underscore sub. Uh, sub str uh, just wraps those and that's where we get to the bug the bug is actually in kind of the mb string functions themselves because they handle invalid utf8 so also i should clarify mb is multi-byte which is just meant to handle like these encodings that use uh multiple bytes to encode one character it's not doing like the expecting just ascii and parsing it as though it's just like the ascii characters in case other encodings are used, like commonly used UTF-8. So the bug is because these two functions, surpause and substring under there, treat invalid UTF-8 sequences differently. And specifically, uh, if you're not familiar with the how UTF-8 encoding works, I'm definitely not going to get into all of it here. But one of the things that does matter is what, like, the first byte of a UTF-8 character looks like. Specifically, like, the first bits, actually. If the first bit is zero, it's it's a one-byte character. It's your ASCII characters. ASCII actually fits within just 128 characters. There's extended ASCII, which continues that. Uh, but So it's actually just a seven-bit encoding. So first bit is zero. The rest of it is just ASCII. Makes sense. And then you kind of have this encoding that's meant to indicate how many bytes are going to follow this first byte. That's where you'll see, if you're able to watch, it goes like if it starts with 110, then that means there's going to be one more byte or one once so there's two bytes in total. Or if there's 1110, that's there's three ones to start with, so there's three bytes total. And of course, if there's four ones and then zero, there's four bytes total. So that's kind of the high level encoding of the size itself. And then all those continuation bytes, the ones that come after this first one, will just always start with one zero. It's basically saying like, you know, read this whole byte. And then all the leftover bits are combined to actually get like the values that they need. And there's a whole bunch that goes into that, which I won't touch on. But that's kind of important, those starting bits, because it does indicate what the size should be. And so where we have the bug is that when string position is parsing through, what it will do is that it will read kind of that leading byte, starts with whatever, and then it's going to read like the next byte, the next byte, and the next byte, and just make sure it is like a continuation byte that it can parse it. And as soon as it runs into a byte that it cannot parse, 
it will basically be like, this is an invalid bite, and thus maybe this is the start of a new character or something. And so it will like end its parsing there. So even if the leading byte indicates there's going to be three bytes following, if like the very next byte just doesn't look like the right continuation character, it's just going to stop there and count like just those two bytes as, or I'm sorry, just the one byte before. It's not going to include the invalid byte. It'll restart parsing at the invalid byte as though that's a start of a new character. And there are, like, if you're trying to listen to this and trying to follow it, basically it just means, like, it's going to, it can potentially stop in the middle of what would otherwise be a character if they don't look like valid bytes for UTF-8. And on the other side of that, the substring function will just look at that first byte, see how many bytes it should be, and skip over the rest of them to what would should be the next character. So you can create like a parser or desync between these, where one of them is going to think, you know, the third character starts in one place, whereas the other is going to think the third character started somewhere else. And so you can kind of smuggle in more characters because of this bug, which is exactly how they go about actually getting their XSS is by smuggling in characters that are going to be skipped over by the substring so it doesn't remove them properly. So kind of taking advantage of the fact that there's this desync between how they handle these invalid characters in order to smuggle in their XSS payload. Because I think at a glance, anybody would say, like, this code looks fine. It looks like it's doing what it should be. But these edge cases over how it parses UTF-8 bytes creates this bug so it's a really cool bug um, that's what i love about it yeah is the fact that like you a lot of people would skip over it they'd be like oh yeah this is pretty simple and what it's doing and yeah it works like uh if you just do testing on what it's supposed to do then it works fine you have to dive into the implementation of it to really get into why it's problematic yeah yeah and to notice like the air case because most people aren't like sending invalid utf-8 sequences to test this like that's not a test case that's generally thought of maybe should be now but yeah i don't know i i thought this was a really cool bug to see i had to read through because i thought this was just going to be a boring xss but no it turns out they've got something pretty deep here and uh really cool really good find i'm a little bit like since this is coming from automated source scanning I'm assuming this thing didn't actually know about the MB bug. And it's just like you're echoing and it looks like this gets user input and probably knows that like it reads the, you know, get or post or whatever parameters. Uh, so it probably knows that and sees it as the input. They had to go a little bit deeper to find it as a multibyte, like the multibyte bug, or maybe it did actually, you know, find this really deep bug and know like oh yeah you can smuggle it through there but that feels a little bit beyond what most static analysis tooling actually does so i don't think that's the case but they do call out like uh it at least led them along that path along the path to find the bug actually i guess we can view the issue on sonar cloud so i can open it up and uh take a look if it's just yeah, it just knows the get as being a sync. So it doesn't understand the nuances of the multi-byte bug at all. It just understands that get is the source of user input and therefore can be a problem. Um, it doesn't understand the filtering or it doesn't appear to understand the filtering. So fair enough. It's working more or less how I would have expected. But yeah, it's it's a cool bug. I mean, I could leave it at that. Great find. Yeah, and uh, also highlight that because the use of multibyte surpost and substr was in the like this library, the string helper library, that kind of hides the bug too. Um, which is why in the patch you can see that they basically just don't use that string helper surpost method and use surpost and substr directly um, that aren't multibyte aware. Uh, there was a little bit of interesting stuff with the patch here too, um, sort of like the last topic, because. This issue was ultimately fixed in PHP in 8.3 and 8.4, but it wasn't backported because it wasn't considered a security issue, which seems to be a common recurring problem with PHP where they just don't want to consider bug fixes that could have security implications. They just don't want to like consider that. 
um, or backport fixes. So well, that they don't kind consider of older um, products or products using older PHP like Joomla two. So yeah, and the thing is, like PHP doesn't consider like their whole sandbox escapes and like uh, safe mode escapes as being security issues. They just don't consider security issues security issues. Yeah, their threat model is very interesting. We'll say so. Even though this is kind of a PHP bug, uh, this did have to be addressed by Joomla, which was just by replacing the function that was used. Because it turns out that while they were doing the multi byte aware stuff, they didn't actually need that. So that's why the fix was relatively easy. But yeah, like you said, just a very cool scenario. When the bug is at that low of a level, like at the language level, it's something that can affect a lot of products and it's difficult to know because yeah, you're writing the code and it looks correct. You're testing it. It's doing what you're expecting. And you kind of just trust the implementation to work as you expect it to. Yeah, the so, audits tend to focus on reading the code that, like, your client wrote and, like, your application code, not the PHP code, unless you're specifically looking for PHP issues. Yeah, you so. generally don't want to assume that there's a bug in, like, the language or the compiler or something. That's kind of where your mind goes to last. Uh, or where it should go to last. So, yeah. Yeah, I was just going to say, unless it's a bug that you, know, you just don't want to fully troubleshoot, so just blame the compiler or engine. <laughs> yeah, true. All right, so uh, up next, we have uh, GoGo XSS Gadgets, which has some DOM clobbering. And this is a pretty complicated uh, exploit chain flow, which Z had dug into, so I'll let him get into it. Yeah, like I said, kind of complicated. They've got, I think they come down to like nine steps here. I get, okay, no, eight steps. Dom clobbering happens on step eight. Uh, but they, I think they call out here right at the top that, you know, they their XSS chain here on this redacted system incorporates several interesting methods that are usually, or they usually see in write-ups or capture the flag challenges, so... You know, this is redacted. We don't know exactly where it was, but they are saying this is found in a real target through a bug bounty program. And so we start with just, hey, what sort of functionality looks like it might be vulnerable? Where they come across the post message. So connect.secure.domain1.com. It will set up a message listener. So it's listening for post messages. And these are often or often can be sources of bugs. We've definitely talked about quite a few bugs that come through this, oftentimes through a bad validation of origin. So anybody can kind of send the message and then it's up to the developer of the site to actually accept the message and to do something with it. And one thing they should do with it is validate the origin of the message. In this case, it seems like it is, you know, relatively secure and just limited to any a uh, subdomain of domain one or any subdomain of domain two being allowed to send messages to this. And I uh, should also mention connect.secure is like their whole authentication kind of platform domain that's used for that. So that's where like the login can be shown and has all of that sort of functionality. So it's a very important subdomain and they call out here. It's where authenticated users interact with their accounts. So you know, other other domains can kind of reference it, send these post messages over to do whatever they actually need. And the fact that there's two domains there, domain one is, of course, the domain that they're actually on, but domain two is also supported. That then opens up the scope for if they could find an XSS bug over on domain two, they could then use that to send a post message. But of course, it's going to depend on whether or not there's anything interesting to do with the post message. And what they found is that in the post message ultimately leads down into this login widget that can be used that will set some values through inner HTML so you can inject content that way. And so, you know, they have some interesting functionality here, which means it's worth going off to domain two, trying to find the access, which they indeed do find. Um, and it's a pretty straightforward thing. They mentioned, fortunately, we found that when submitting the form, some of our values got reflected inside of script. So they have a script tag. Some of their values are in there. They can break down and they, you know, uh, do like the single quote semicolon alert. And they're able to get access on domain two. Very straightforward thing there. It comes back to this post message. How are they going to send the post message up? There's a little bit of complexity around how they would send that. So you can use like window.open, but 
that means the user must have already interacted with the page before you get to like open a new window otherwise you can't or they could use iframe but there's xframe options being set the same origin in domain two is not going to be same origin as domain one so can't do that but they actually can as they later found out that the connect.secure domain will actually or at least one of the pages for widgets will allow this allow from parameter that lets them actually do more but they do go through a lot of this post using kind of the re user interaction required window.open. Um, I'm mostly going to talk about this as though there's an iframe or as though something else is going on. It doesn't really matter, I suppose. They then get into the next problem being the content security policy, being that the content security policy requires that there be a nonce with any scripts that you want to, uh, like, any arbitrary script that you want to uh, inject, or you can include scripts from domain one, two, three, or four. Again, we don't know what the name or what the actual names of these are, but there were four domains and their subdomains. That could be, you know, you could just arbitrarily allow scripts from without the nonce. And then there's no unsafe inline. So that takes away a lot of the common methods. So a reasonable CSP policy here. I mean, it's not, it's not obviously insecure. So given that their step five here is basically how are they going to inject an external script into the already load DOM when they can't use that unsafe eval. So they can't just inject a script with their inner HTML. Can't, can't quite do that. Uh, then they're writing to the DOM with the inner HTML function. All of that happens when like the document itself has already been loaded. And that's where they call out using the script source doc trick. Seeing this, it's been around for a while where instead of providing a source, uh, what you're doing is you're providing the source document of the script. So usually what you would actually put between the script tags, but you're providing it as an attribute inside of the script tag um, where you can then include the script source, which is kind of the route that they went for what their injection would actually be to get some code executing. But they still kind of, that's, you know, how they could inject the external script is by using the source doc to inject another script tag that includes the source. But they still kind of have to have, like, some CSV bypass. They can include some script, but they can't just include arbitrary scripts. Either they need the nonce, which they can't leak, or they need, you know, some sort of bypass. And fortunately in this, uh, sounds like a very corporate environment. They have a lot of... Um, domains kind of running a lot of like old dev staging QA environments that are public facing. So not being limited to just their internal network that haven't been updated that, you know, I've been maybe sitting around for a while on their own little domain, doing their own thing, whatever. Uh, they were able to find a number of CSP bypasses on domain two, just through some of these relatively random domains, not having information uh, updated. Main one that they went and used here, at least at first, was this Angular one click, which would inject a link that a user then had to click on, and that, you know, when they click, it can execute JavaScript, which is kind of how they put everything together in this. And then, after actually reporting the issue, you know, they got their access with user interaction, but after reporting the issue, they actually found basically a new CSP bypass, which was this fragments page. So it turns out on the original domain, connect.secure, they had some static web assets, one in there being these fragments that would get loaded and injected at runtime, or, well, at runtime. It's all on the web. It's always runtime. Uh, but that would get loaded. And one of these fragments, the mcombined fragment.html, would effectively just create a script. It would create a new script element and do all that. And then a script source would be read from the window.parent mglobals nuance launch js so it would basically get this source from a global variable that m globals and it's inject that interesting. like i don't do a ton of web stuff but i haven't seen like dynamic creation of script elements like that before <laughs> maybe oh, it's just happens. like my lack of yeah okay that's probably just my lack of experience in it then yeah, no, that happens relatively often when you're dealing with more complex systems, especially when you want to deal with something that's maybe being injected by a third party wanting to include. Yeah, you'll definitely see that. 
Okay. So, like, the source is a little bit weird, like, going through the parent uh, and all of that. That is a little bit weird, but, like, creating the script itself isn't that crazy. Sorry, that's what I meant. Like, creating the script and, like, dynamically setting the source like that. Like, that that stood out as a bit weird to me. Well, again, like, dynamically setting the source, but it's, like, where the source is coming from is, like, a little bit weird, but not that uncommon. Like, even this isn't that unheard of. Going through window parents a little bit, because usually you would see this just as, like, part of the actual page and not being loaded as part of a fragment. But when you are dealing with fragments, like, it does start to make a little bit more sense, given kind of what they're doing by including... Because a lot of, like, the functionality on this, like, the post message stuff is allowing, like, the iframe to get loaded with, like, other content and, like, to show a dialogue for whatever purpose. We don't actually know the application here, but given kind of what it's doing, like, this this makes sense in my mind within it. I'm not too surprised by it personally. Either way, because it is going through window.parent and it's using one of the globals there... Dumb clobbering becomes a possibility, especially because they are having some control over the parent and the values there. So they're able to use like the iframe name M global. So they give that as the name, and inside of that, they have the nuance launch JS as one of the anchor tag IDs with a uh, you know value to some other JavaScript. And so through that, they use the DOM clobbering, which is cool to see. You don't see a lot of things outside of CTFs, or at least I don't, use actually using DOM clobbering. We've talked about a few things, but basically they were able to use that to get control over this value that would be loaded by the legitimate script that's allowed to run in order to do arbitrary uh, JavaScript to get that run. So... Kind of a complex chain there, a lot to kind of talk about coming through the post message and how they actually got there. I tried to summarize as best I could, but the post is is relatively well written. Guy documents the whole flow there, so definitely check out the post. And well, that was uh, I think the main author here is Brett Burhaus. Sam Curry was also involved here along with uh Make Robert, so some familiar names out of that. Yeah, I will say. Uh, the other thing that made it a little bit tricky to follow for me personally was because of the, uh, you know, obfuscation where they couldn't talk about the target and had to insert like domain one and stuff like that. It made it a little bit harder to keep track of where you don't have all the context. But like you said, like it's still well written. They go through everything and then step by step, but there's a lot to keep track of, uh, which I think they kind of note towards the end of the post is that, you know, keep track of every, like all the pieces, all the CSP rules, all these things. And, um, you know, it's, it's easy to focus on something in isolation, but in a chain like this, you can't really do that. So, yeah, it's a lot of things that just kind of come together, uh, yeah. kind of in the end there. Uh, but yes, yeah, it's still like great exploit, uh, really fun exploit out of this. So we'll get into our last topic here, which is uh, an issue that was reported by Project Zero, specifically Jan Horn in Chrome. And typically, these Project Zero Chrome issues don't really appear on the bounty episodes, but in this case, it's a higher level issue in the extension API, specifically the page capture dot save as MHTML function, which is a privileged function for capturing page contents. Where page contents can be pretty sensitive, there's a permission system that the function has to respect, where the extension first first foremost has to have permission to capture pages, but it also can't capture document URI origins that aren't uh, blocked by the host. So, and there's also some limitations on the schemes, like it has to be like HTTP or HTTPS or the extension's own origin or like the Chrome extension data web store prefixes. But the issue is the way they check for this is racy. He found that if you continuously navigate a tab between an allowed URI and a blocked one as a malicious extension, and then continuously try the save as MHTML calls, the extension will eventually be able to pull the contents of the blocked URI. And that's because there's a fairly simple time of check time of use issue here, where the logic for checking if the URI is allowed is done, then it'll save the page content. And because they don't track the document ID in that process, you can basically slip a navigate in between that to get the contents to save after the renavigation and that check has already passed. So a fairly simple talk to and how it works, but not really an area that you would expect to find one, which you know I suspect is 
why it, it took a little while to define this issue. The impact of it is, you know, it would require a malicious extension, so it does require that aspect, and it is ultimately saving page contents, but still, it could be fairly impactful. Jan notes that if Chrome was still, sorry, if extensions were still allowed to access file URIs, which was fixed previously as like a defense in depth thing, it would be a lot more impactful. And it can be on platforms that aren't on that version of Chrome yet. So yeah, there, there's kind of that separation of impact where on older versions, it might be more useful. But still, um, it's an interesting area to, to find a bug. And ultimately, yeah, it comes down to a talk to which in a browser extension API is kind of weird. Yeah, I'll just say like, what I liked with this bug was it. I mean, it, it is a fun bug. Again, it's a race. I like races. I always like races. Um, so it, it has that going for it. But this is also like it, it's a legitimate Chrome bug that I feel like anybody that's actually watching our bounty episodes can probably go and find something like that themselves. Yeah, it would take understanding some of the inner details of how like extensions work and stuff but it is a chrome bug and like hunting on the chrome bug bounty program that i think a lot of people are more capable of doing than they might give themselves benefit of it's just like these because these are sorts of issues that we have talked about before is being found in chrome like there are these higher level things it's not always like super deep binary things and we've talked about it also with like some opera bugs we've covered like, you know, yeah. these sorts of bugs exist too. And I don't know, I think it's just kind of a reminder to go hunt on some of these too, if you're, at least if you're interested, in it. obviously, you know, hunt where you're interested in, but I don't know, I thought it was worth calling out for that reason. Yeah, I mean, it's easy for me at least to tunnel vision on things like Chrome and just my mind immediately jumps to like memory corruption style issues. But especially when you're dealing with extensions and those complicated features, the logical issues need to be looked at too. Yeah. So that's all the issues that we have for the episode. We do have a few shout outs. Uh, so Z, I'll let you get into some of them here. All right. So yeah, first shout out I've got is a couple posts from Haptus who said, uh, diving back into game relay bugs. And again, this is one of those things where in my mind, when I think about game hacking, I think about like the reverse engineering and cheats for like trying to find whatever offsets for like health or you know that sort of cheating on there i think of that with game related bugs whereas he dives into a lot of other kind of higher level bugs like calls here invisible items for sale uh you know try to equip things like you know with specific ids there's actually two posts to this there's this one here which goes into some just game related bugs in general and then he has another post that was put out like same day uh, about bugs specifically to card related uh games so just a few other things to think about just calls out some bug classes that also kind of remind you about taking into consideration your actual target and what they're intending to do and like breaking their intents not just go find xss go find uh you know web cache deception or something like you know thinking about what your application is doing and trying to violate those things rather than just specific attacks so yeah, definitely a few solid posts, just things to get you thinking a bit. I kind of liked the uh, the date time bugs that they mentioned for like bypassing limited time offer and stuff like that. Just because like date time has always been something that's so hard to deal with from a programmer standpoint. And I haven't really thought about the implications that can be had on games, especially games with very like FOMO heavy design philosophy. But yeah, it's, it's definitely like a a place to look for some cool exploits against games yeah like i said it's it's just one of those areas that in my mind like i think of the memory corruption stuff but there are definitely people out there doing this work that you know isn't necessarily memory corruption but it's still some very cool bugs so, and yeah. in many ways it's more important uh or it's more like uh catastrophic from the game devs point of view yeah at least for the game devs they, they might not care if you're able to infect other players with malware but don't infect the server don't cause problems yeah. there <laughs> but yeah definitely a couple posts there i think it's a pretty new blog so hopefully we'll see some more good stuff coming out from there and the other shout out i've got is exploiting empire c2 framework this is just kind of fun because it is you know empire c2 so your command and control system 
go out, you install your agents on like your actual target. They report back to the C2 server or however you want to do your communication. But in this case, it turns out that there was a bug and apparently this is an older bug or at least has some history with this uh, 2016 bug dubbed Skywalker where there was just like, you know, simple path traversal in this or I guess there was the path traversal there. This one is a bit newer, but when agents are, I think, uploading files, basically they can have a path traversal and just have it overwrite files. It goes a little bit into it, but I didn't think like the whole post was that interesting to actually cover the vulnerability. So, you know, goes with the path traversal stuff, which generally isn't that interesting. But the context is like, kind of interesting. Yeah. Uh, uh, just the context of having, you know, it's it's pen test, it's red team tooling, getting attacked here. So it's kind of fun to see that sort of thing. Of course, I've often said how security people tend to write very insecure code. Uh, so this is kind of a case of that and that going on here. But um, yeah, just, just a fun bug if you want to check it out. I just didn't want to go too detailed on it in terms of covering it. Because, like, as a bug, it isn't interesting, but the context is. And another thing that we didn't want to go too deep on covering was Apple's uh, security research lab put out a post on iMessage with PQ3, the new state of the art in quantum secure messaging at scale. So, yeah, they announced that they're doing, like, a security upgrade in iMessage history um, with the groundbreaking post-quantum cryptography protocol. Uh, it's basically doing some like a hybrid sort of thing. So it uses uh, Kyber post quantum public keys with classic crypto like ecliptic curve. So that's about all I can really go into detail on it, though. Part of the reason we don't want to do full coverage on it is because I'm too dumb to do a full technical coverage of this. It's not very just crypto you. heavy. Um, I, <laughs> yeah, I have some people. It's a very specialty uh, area. Yeah, like I have specialty have... in. I have like I do know some on the elliptic curve crypto, but when you get uh into off the quantum stuff, I I just don't have the base fundamentals on that to really talk about. But it's too Apple security, edge. yeah, it does put out some good posts. Like we've covered a lot of well, not a lot of posts because they haven't put out a lot of posts yet in general. Uh, but I thought it might be interesting to some of you out there with the interest on, on crypto. Uh, to see this, but yeah, it's not something we're just capable of covering, to be honest. Yeah, there is some interesting tidbits in there, though, too. Like they talk kind of about the uh, collect now, break later sort of philosophy, and that's what they're trying to prevent, basically, with this protocol, uh, with using the the post quantum public keys. So, yeah, a lot of interesting stuff there, but yeah, it's just the technical details are difficult for us to cover. But the, I'm sure they're, it's still interesting to read, even if you don't fully understand all of it. Even if you're not super into the crypto, I'd recommend at least giving it a try. Because, uh, like I said, I, I learned some stuff just from glancing through some of it. But yeah, so that's all the topics we have for today. So, as always, thanks goes out to everyone who tuned in. Feel free to join the community by joining our Discord and Twitter. Links for those are in the description. And with that said, we'll see you in the next one.